WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are uh, positively, um, you know, into a, a political season here. We're, we're going to take a moment away from what's going on in Europe here to talk about some things going on in Baltimore. Don Mueller joins us here. One thing going on in Baltimore next week, uh, we're going to be renewing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery. I'm going to be over at Mama's on the Half Shell. Crab cakes every Friday through the spring, and then in May, we're going to be branching out all over the city and all over the community. Don, I haven't had a crab cake this year, and uh, I'm hoping that when this guy's uh, fancy TV project all takes place, that uh, maybe I'll have a crab cake with him and some of the other folks. But um, I mean, we were bringing on all sorts of serious journalists here, so this one's going to be a great one. It's been a busy afternoon here. Today is Journalism Day. We've had some of Maryland's best, and we're excited to have coming back to join us again, uh, formerly of the Baltimore Sun. Uh, doing great work there, primarily on the crime beat. Now heading along with so many others over to the Baltimore banner that have so many of us excited. And we will be talking about his upcoming HBO project. We own this city. We welcome back Justin Fenton. Justin, welcome back to Baltimore Positive. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, some folks say we own this city upcoming project. Like, no, no, no. I read the book last summer and we had right. that last year at the other paper and like all of that. Um, this has really turned into something. I mean, I know the last time we had you on, it was like happening and rumored to be happening and all of that. But just bring us up to speed, not just on the banner thing, but on this television show. That's a six episode series that I think anyone that, that read the book or even came in contact or read the Cliff's notes uh, will probably want to check this out. And uh, this must be exciting for you to have this turn into something visual, right? I mean, it's, it's surreal. I mean, it's not something I ever thought was going to happen. Um, you know, when and I started the book, it was always contemplated that there would be a show made by David Simon and George Pelicanos and Ed Burns who did the wire and other great shows. Um, but, you know, it took some time. Uh, I, I got the book out. Uh, we were working on this show and writing it. Uh, I was part of the writer's room, which is an amazing opportunity. And then, uh, yeah, they started filming it last summer and wrapped up in November. And uh, they just announced the air date. The air date is April 25th. It'll be on HBO and HBO Max. And uh, I'm just real excited to see, um, you know, for, for people to be able to, to, to see it. Um, I got to see some filming myself, and it was great. But, uh, you know, I haven't seen a finished product, and I'm really, really eager. Well, Justin, as, as you know, because we talked when the book came out, I, I kid, we had Bill Zorsi on and, and I kidded Bill. Very reluctant guest to like, I said, not talking was crap great. Bill was great, you know, and I said to him, I know I had to sell 50 books because everybody I ran into, I said, you, you have to read this book, block, a, put a day or two aside because you won't be able to put it down. It, it was compelling. And for folks who are listening and aren't familiar with it, I, I guess what I'll ask you to do is give them sort of the the, the four dummies summary. It's the sure. Baltimore Gun Trace Task Force, Wayne Jenkins and the boys. Uh, give folks sort of a summary of what they're about to see on We Own This City when they turn HBO on. Yeah, so the, the book is focused on the Gun Trace Task Force scandal. It was a, a group of plainclothes officers who were you know, sent out on the streets to try to do proactive policing and, and get guns off the street. But really, these guys were abusing the discretion that they had to rob people and uh, steal, steal money, steal drugs, to arrest people for you know, search them without probable cause. But really, the book tries to take a long view of it about the city's battle with crime basically a 15 year view starting around the O'Malley administration and the city's constant efforts to try to use the police to fight crime and the things that have happened along the way. Some of the warning signs, some of the scandals that cropped up but weren't really taken seriously. And that's what's important about this story going forward is like, how do we prevent this from happening again? Obviously the police department is under a federal consent decree where a judge is mandating reforms, but you know, over the years, people have always said that they were trying to improve things and everything was always getting better. And really, there's a lot of stuff going on at the surface that they weren't willing to talk about or weren't even aware of, really. I mean, you can't say that they knew about it, per se. Um, but, you know, I think I think that's very important that, that we don't let history repeat itself. Well, Justin, when you say we can't let history re repeat itself, um, this this. This was clearly a topic that you knew, I mean, inside and out. I mean, you, you really dove into this topic. And 
uh, what, what I'll come back. Some of this we covered before, but I, I think it's important to revisit it for folks. And the question we asked Bill this, and I, I won't tell you his answer, um, but I'll ask you the same thing again. After living it through the book and now reliving it again through the HBO series, the question that Nestor continues to raise is was it possible for all of this to happen and the higher ups truly not know anything about what was going on? That's the question that people always ask me. Where, where do you come down now after several, several years of looking at this? I mean, I think the answer to that is that by its nature, people who are robbing people and, and stealing drugs and dealing drugs, they're not going to want people to know about that you know they keep a close circle or they don't tell anybody i think that's the just criminal nature so to expect that people knew about that i don't i don't i don't i don't think that any evidence through all these different reviews and investigations and my own research has really shown that they knew that i think what is really clear though is that they did know that these officers had problems they had integrity problems there was questions being raised there's accusations being made uh, i think there's very much a, a, um, a lack of um you know pe people did not trust when someone who was arrested made a complaint, they said, oh, of course they're saying that. They're just saying that because they got arrested. Um, but at a certain point, these, these things start to accumulate. And, and when you're dismissing them as one-offs uh, and not looking at the bigger picture, you know, some of these officers weren't really well known to the public. Some of these officers, when they were arrested, it was the first time I'd ever heard their names. Others were extremely well known. I mean, there was the one officer, Daniel Hersel, who I wrote about a couple of weeks ago. It was my last, one of my last stories for The Sun. I mean, Everybody knew about his, his history. With the son had written about him, it's been raised in numerous different ways, and, and they just kept throwing him back out there. And that circles back to that idea of, you know, the crime fight. It's all about the crime fight. And he was seen as someone who was working hard and getting results. Um, if, if someone had, if people had looked a little bit closer, they would, they would have seen that they, they weren't quite getting those results. These cases didn't stand up in court. But from their perspective of this day in and day out fight uh, against against crime. You know, they, they perceived these officers to be effective and they wanted to keep that going. Justin, well, uh, for, for me, ahead, the, the question for this is how big was the circle? Uh, you know, how many people really knew about, did girlfriends know about? Like, uh, other than the, the, the actual drug dealers that are getting robbed, who I guess couldn't say we were getting robbed or what, whatever was happening with the crimes they were committing Primarily to criminals, correct? Right? They they robbed criminals exclusively or primarily, right? I would say primarily, but not exclusively. No, there's plenty of people who got who got caught up because they were they they fit the profile. They were getting profiled. They they were stopped because the police were fishing. That was one of the things that really I I think was eye opening for me was this idea of like so oftentimes the police will hold a press conference or we'll see a court case where they got a gun. They pulled someone over and got a gun, but you really don't hear about. The times where they pull people over and find nothing and what i did was i i asked for all the body camera footage god bless body cameras i mean to be able to see all the people they pulled over for you know for being too far from the curb from being you know uh, at a gas pump without a seat belt on there's so many people got pulled over for having uh, not having a seat belt on at a gas pump you know you're, you're just getting your yourself back into your car you're getting situated. You're, you're pulling. You're not even pulled out on the street, and you're getting pulled over for not having a seatbelt on. And but if that talking, happened to the three of us as white dudes, like we'd be like, "You're kidding me, right? Like you've got to be this, kidding me." This was a common tactic. They got them driving off of CVS parking lots, still on the property of a gas station, and, and searched and finding nothing. And that's the kind of stuff that people are, you know, when, when people say they're upset with the police, they're upset with about that kind of stuff. They don't want to be treated that way. And and the gun trace task force officers. You know, the ones who cooperated with the government really spoke openly about these things. They told us, this is what we did. This is how we did it. You know, we pulled over as many people as we could because we knew at a certain point we're going to get lucky and, and hit on a gun. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, and, but, but to go back to your question about how many people knew, I, again, I think what I said before, I don't, I, I don't think it was good for business for these officers to let everybody know. But we've certainly seen examples where it's clear that officers, were, there was a wink and a nudge, you know, a, a wink and a nod and sort of, you know, looking the other way and things like that. I think people knew, even if they didn't know specifics. And I think they also, um, one of the things that's come out is sort of they, they surround themselves with like-minded officers. So if they got a hunch that somebody wasn't down with that or that they couldn't trust them, they sort of moved to get themselves away from those people. So in that sense, not everybody knew. 
Um, but there was, um, I think, I think, you know, smoke, smoke signals and things like that. Well, there's a lot of stories yeah. as well as the officers coming out saying, I turned, I saw what that guy was doing. I turned him in and they threw me out. Right. Like that, that was part of this as well. Right. Not, not that directly, but yeah, I mean, there, again, there was officers who, who were sort of not down with the program and got transferred and things like that. So to that extent, they don't know what's going on. They get moved away before they really find out about it. There's not a lot of whistleblower type stuff going on. The book does focus on, there's one officer, Ryan Gwynn, who brought suspicions to the deputy commissioner. He said, you know, I don't have a good feeling about this, this officer. I saw him hanging out with a guy that we're investigating as a drug dealer in this neighborhood. But did he have the, the goods to really have the officer fire or discipline that guy? Or, or maybe did he bring something to their attention that should have caused him to look deeper and they failed to do that? I think that's more of the situation. And there's the, there's the th again, we're with Justin Fenton, long time. Baltimore Sun reporter, outstanding crime reporter, moving to the new Baltimore banner, already at the banner in his temporary office. And again, Nestor and I, uh, you know, our good friend, we always tip our hat to uh, the gone too soon Ted Venetoulis and the Venetoulis Institute. Uh, Ted, one of the most important people uh, in, in, the, in the region. And the banner will be selling subscriptions soon. So if you believe in a robust free press, please be ready to subscribe to the banner. J Justin, one of the things that I was struck by when I read the book the first time, and it stood out to me, maybe this goes to what you're talking about again, that there should have been some warning signs, was that, I, I think I've said before, I have a cousin that was like a brother to me that ended up as a major in the state police. I don't think he ever fired his gun. Most police officers that I've known, and I have a lot of close friends who are Baltimore County police officers, who come out very well in Justin Fenton's book, by the way. The he Baltimore always points County that out, Police, Justin. Just so you know. Baltimore County Police Department. It's like but you ran the county or something. Most of them have never, in their career, will never fire their gun. I want to say that Wayne Jenkins, I think he had more than 20 incidences, incidences where he fired his gun, right? I mean, it was... It was something crazy. It was, it was, he fired was, no. his gun. No, no, no. I mean, the, the, the brutality stuff, there were some instances, instances where he beat people up or things like that. And mostly early in his career, I, I believe I can only think of one shooting. He was involved oh, okay. with he didn't fire his weapon. And he, he, he bear hugged somebody and, and other officers fired once they said they saw a gun. But well, yeah. I asked you this. Okay. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I misremembered it. I asked you this before, now that you've studied, and, and live this Jenkins character for a number of years. What was it that allowed him to have the hold on these other officers that he did? What's, what's the magnetism of Wayne Jenkins? Uh, he was described as a, as a cowboy, as someone who, you know, went out on the streets and, and was fearless. Um, car crashes, car chases, you know, effective at getting guns. He was very brash in the sense that he, you know, he, he made sure everybody in the department knew how good he was. He sent out these daily emails so that, that the whole department would know that they got guns. Um, when he was challenged, he, he pushed back. You know, he was investigated by internal affairs and they, they brought charges against him um, in a case where someone said drugs were planted. And when he finally beat the case, he sent this defiant email like back to internal affairs saying like, how, you know, how dare you? And, you know, how, how dare you do that to me and things like that. So he, he and this was not someone who was sort of you know, flying under the radar, lurking in the shadows. This is somebody who's very in your face. And I think that was by design to try to, you know, like, so, so people wouldn't, wouldn't suspect him because he's, he's someone who's so, so out there. So, so, uh, uh, you know, pro, you know, uh, proactive in maintaining his reputation. I think that was all by design. Justin, any I remorse, would say you, 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 go ahead, Don. I'm just going to say any remorse on Jenkins's part, down the road as you followed up, as you sort of kept track on him? Any regrets on his part? Well, I'm sure he's full of regrets. He's serving a long term in prison. But as far, you know, he really tried to maintain and I think continued to try to maintain that he's not guilty of all the things he's accused of. I think at first he said it was all made up. And then he started to start, he sort of, um, I think since then has tried to say, um, you know, I did some of these things, but not all. He did a radio interview a podcast interview with uh, the BBC actually from prison uh, where he admitted some things. And I think he, but he also, you know, he, he, he uh, there was a review recently, an outside review by uh, Michael Bromwich, the former inspector general of the justice department. And he did a review of this case, took, took years, um, cost the city like $5 million. And, you know, he tried to talk to Jenkins and Jenkins had all these demands, you know, he wouldn't, he wanted it to be on his terms. 
And they basically talked to him for a brief time and told him, forget it. Um, so, I mean, you know, that I think that kind of gives a, a window into his current mindset. Justin, uh, making a film out of this or making a dramatization out of it, I mean, I, I think it's one thing for a journalist like you to say, all right, we're going to do a documentary and we're just going to go with the facts and we have pictures and we have evidence and we have you know people we could sit down and talk to about and piecing the story together. I love that stuff. Um, and But this is different. This is David getting involved in this. Um, I have never seen The Wire. I've admitted that already to Bill Zorzi uh, once this week, but um, talk me into seeing this because I'm going to commit the six hours to doing it just because I'm so fascinated by your book and the story. But in putting this together as a dramatization, where do we meet Wayne Jenkins in your story? You know what I mean? Is this first time out where he roughs up the first person and get I, I'm, I'm trying to get a hold of the, how you turn this incredibly heinous story into television, because I'm sure you are f- unfamiliar with this as well. Yeah, no, it was very interesting to observe the process. I was there mostly as a consultant to sort of try to throw out real life events that happened, try to make sure things were based in things that things and real real people and real events. Um, you know, I, I think that um, um, I'm trying to think what's what's my pitch for why you should watch it. I mean, again, these are talented storytellers. They've done so many amazing shows. You know, Show Me a Hero and The Deuce and and uh, The Plot Against America. I think you know The Wire. Um, uh, showed people, um, you know, the drug war and the, the, the different, the ways people experience the criminal justice system and how this city, uh, you know, was, was run. Uh, it was based on events that were true from the, uh, off the, the writer's experiences, but, but ultimately fiction. Um, this, this story is real, you know, this story really happened. Um, and we have actors that are going to portray those real people and tell that story. There's other people who are sort of symbols of, 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 of other, you know, there, there's a character who's an investigator from the Department of Justice, and she comes here trying to understand how these things happen. So through her, you know, we, we, she interviews people, residents, police officers, trying to understand how we got here and how we can get out of it. And so I just think, um, you know, I, I think based on a true story is, uh, is a good way to tell it. Um, so we can recreate some of these things that we don't have camera footage for we weren't there for that we can't tell through a documentary um but instead with these great actors like josh charles who's from baltimore and john bernthal who's amazing and seems like he's in everything these days so i hope uh i hope it tells uh, i hope people learn something how how much of it do you know what was said from witnesses and saying this is the way this went down in an alley or wherever these incidents of crime happen to know what Wayne Jenkins might have actually said. You know, I, and I, again, I, we're not making reality TV here, but just trying to put yourself, because I'm sure in writing the book and through all this, you're getting real quotes as a reporter would, right. and then trying to piece the rest of it together as to how the hell this they got away with this. Because that really is the story. I mean, that's the thing that Don and I are like, how the hell did this happen? Um, I'm sure the TV part of this is trying to explain how it happened. Yeah, I mean, for the books, for sure, there's no quote, there's no quotes that weren't actually said by somebody. And, and so I relied on court documents, videos of court hearings, you know, body camera videos, all reports. There's wiretaps from when the FBI was investigating where we can actually re- real time conversations, um, including conversations that didn't get released to the public. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, so for this, the, the dialogue, there, there's, there's definitely some moments in the show that are directly as they happened. And that was that was surreal to watch you know watching actors say dialogue that in fact is the real dialogue but of course there's many other things where it is our best guess of what might have been said or trying to you know p- portray that moment that we we know happened but we don't have the actual you know we weren't there uh we, there, there wasn't cameras rolling so you know it, 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 it's a mix of that you've never talked to jenkins in your life is that fair to say is that correct or incorrect i have not talked to him I, there was a time where he wanted to speak to me he sent me a package through his via his wife, and it was a video that he said would show that the claims against him were not true. It was a video where someone was claiming, someone had had a press conference and said, um, you know, the gun was planted on me. And he sent me body camera footage that definitively shows that that gun was not planted on that guy. That it, You can see it. It, it. it was not planted. He admitted to it. And so he, but again, in Jenkins' warped world, he's thinking, well, just this one guy's lying, so everybody else is lying, which isn't true. We know that all the other, many of the other things happened beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and then as they said, if you write this, we'll, he'll, he'll talk to you. 
And, and I wanted to write it anyway. I thought it was fair. I thought it was fair to show that not, not every claim was true. This, this fog of how do we know the next time this happens, who's telling the truth and who's not, that, that there's different um, incentives for people to, to perhaps, you know, now that this has come to light, sort of, sort of come to the table with all sorts of claims. So, I, so I, I wrote it because I wanted to write it regardless. And he must not have liked it, or maybe he got what he needed out of me and he did not speak to me. Then I think they approached me. Um, he had a friend he served time with who's out now who was trying to coordinate interviews. And at a certain point I felt, and I don't know what, um, other than the sheer curiosity of speaking with him, it didn't seem like he was willing to really own up to things and be honest and he had an agenda. And I, and I really was sort of like, I don't know what the point of this is. So I have what not else, pushed it. <laughs> right, what else am I going to get out of that? Again, we're with Justin Fenton, author of We Own This City, coming to HBO and HBO Max on April the 25th. Justin, I know over the years I've, I've read and, followed authors who whose books end up on the big screen or on hbo some like the adaptation some don't uh you happy with the six episodes as they come out and as it captures your book i haven't seen them yet but again i've seen those scripts and i saw some of the filming and yeah I, i'm i'm uh I, i'm excited for people to, to see it when are you gonna see it man i mean like this is i'm asking you about it you're like oh you know i've seen little parts of it and this is your baby right like and you're not really in control you're just gonna watch it and that's it whatever it is it is <laughs> and this but when when do you get to sit in a suite did they invite you to new york do you get champagne what happens <laughs> man so I'm, I'm not i'm not disavowing the project i did it really is david simon and george pelicott it's their it's their baby you know they're up in new york city editing it I'm lucky to be involved in some way, but but that's you know it's it's their project that I got. To well, Simon was out drunk of. the other night, pissed off that it had to get down to 58 and a half minutes from 61. <laughs> I remember that, and <laughs> you tell him, and I told Zorzi this. I collected this book of maledicta back in the 90s, which is ways to insult people across centuries uh, with all sorts of really heinous insults in every language imaginable, translated to English. And I want to give that to David as a gift for his Twitter use. So you he, let him know that he will definitely he will definitely get a lot of use out of that. But no, and honestly, <laughs> I. I I am at the, at the Baltimore banner. We're not up yet, not up and running, but we're working very hard. There's a lot of work to be done. So, you know, while I'm very excited about the show and, and, and can't wait for it to come out, we're, we are doing some uh, uh, very interesting things here, trying to get set up for our, our, our launch in a few months. And you're well, busy writing the next book. <laughs> I promise to let you talk about the banner at length here. Before we do that though, um, one of the, be malpractice if we don't do this, so many tragic characters in We Own This City. One that I continue to think about, you and I and Nestor have spoken about before, is Sean Souter. Um, uh, again, is Souter, uh, 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 is he just damaged? But I mean, is he just along for the ride at the end? Is he just a tragic figure that gets drawn into this and, we're, we're not sure if he killed himself or not. I mean, what's your take after all this about Sean Souter? Um, you know, I, I, I think I have a take. I also think that, it, you know, it's hard to be definitive about something like this. I don't think, I think we don't know what we don't know. We know what right. the, the evidence suggests. Uh, I would say that the, I was in a documentary that also aired on HBO. It was directed by Sonia Stone, who played Kima on The Wire. And it was a documentary about the Souter case and the intersections to the Gun Trace Task Force. I think that documentary had a certain take on the case. And I think the um, limited series, the scripted series will have a take. I think my take is my book, which is I, I lay out sort of the information that's available. It is a, a, a controversial case and some, some very strong opinions, but yeah, I think, um, I think, I think that it, it's going to, um, <laughs> I'm not punting on your question. I just, uh, <laughs> no, I don't, let me ask it this way. Let me ask it another way. Do you Maybe wake I up have... every day thinking something different or are you definitive in what you think of it? I, I think, um, I think there's some things I'd still like to have answers to, but I also feel as though based on what we know now, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, it, it, it it's unfortunate that it's going to be classified as this open, homicide probably forever I, I think that um i think the department is doing that just to sort of not not wade in and have to take a position but i think i think you know so many things there's so many things in this book and this story that didn't come to light for years and and i just wonder you know if, if something years from now might come out related to this case but i think based on what we know now i think there's some conclusions to be drawn and i think that they do suggest that he, he likely took his own life, but I, I, I don't want to be definitive about something so serious. You know, Justin, 
your response there, I think, is so consistent. And I've spoken to other reporters who have who dived into this case, uh, the Souter case, in some detail. And and I think your description is is really apt in that most of them will say to me, Don, I, my gut tells me that he did take his own life. But I've got to tell you, there's always this other piece that makes me a little uneasy. So it, it's it's almost like everybody's where you are in terms of it, it appears so, but there's a but. So again, so many reasons to tune in on April the 25th. Hey, Justin, talk a little bit about uh, so many of our buds have moved from the sun, uh, coming over to the banner from, uh, you know, uh, Pam Wood to uh, Liz Bowie, uh, you know, got a whole crowd coming over there. Um, how tough of a decision was it? I mean, you were a Sun guy. You grew up there. You cut your teeth there. And now you're on to this exciting new venture. Talk to our listeners about the process of ending up at the Banner. Yeah, I mean, you know, I grew up in Anne Arundel County. I, 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 I've worked at the Sun. It's the only place I've ever worked. Uh, I've spent almost 17 years there, but I'm really excited to be building something here. You know, I joined the Sun when it had over 300 reporters. It now is about 60 um, you know, the banner's starting out with a small number, but we're going to be growing. And, I, you know, this all grew out of the Save Our Sun effort, which was a group of reporters led by Liz Bowie, who you mentioned, trying to, trying to you know, get new ownership, trying to do a nonprofit model for journalism. You know, we just, this has been this slow decline of not just the Sun, but, but all, all media, really. Lo lo local media is struggling. And, you know, we've, there's a chance to rethink it. And so the people that were behind Save Our Sun are now behind this effort. And, it's a new model um, from from top, top to bottom, and um, and I think it's a great it's a great chance to do different. We're rethinking how we cover things. Why do we cover things? What do we cover? You know, we have a lot of conversations about what is a banner story because we're going to try to be different from the sun. We don't want to be, even though yes, I, I spent a lot of time there, and some of my colleagues have come over. And we haven't hired everybody. We, it's important for them that it's not seen as the sun 2.0 because we're trying to do something different. At the same time, it's important to have people who know what they're doing, who know their way around town, who, who, have, who have sources, who have context and history. So we're trying to balance all that and, and, and bring a new vision to journalism. We started a newsletter. Um, we put out two newsletters so far. Again, we're not going to do it all the time because we have a long view of trying to get some really impactful journalism for the launch in a few months. But, you know, Tim Prudente, who came over with me, he did a story about problems at the medical examiner's office. He found a secret morgue downtown in a parking garage where they, they have too many bodies piling up. They can't keep up. Uh, and the um, medical examiner It's was amazing not what government tries to keep secret, right? And Don and I get sideways all the time about, you don't trust it. And I'm thinking, man, if, if Tim's not down there, you're not down there. If the sun goes out of business and, and there's no Ted and there's no Bain, who's... Who's doing well, this in wait, New wait Orleans? Minute, Who's doing minute, this in other minute. places? Investigating you're government. You're not suggesting that I don't believe in transparency in government. And no, I'm, I'm, we don't I'm, need I'm, a robust free press, are No, you? no, no. I'm, I'm saying there is stench in government and someone needs to investigate it. And not just there is there's nothing there to see. I mean, this this story of the morgue thing is so it almost sounds far fetched, like dirty cops. Yeah. I could sort of. See, maybe that could happen, but but hiding these things that reporters have to go find these things, or the FBI, in you know certain cases, has to find these things. It really, I I shudder at a world without that. Literally, if we don't have that, and that's that is what like you know um, we feel a lot of pressure for that reason because we know there are a lot of things that we should be looking into that maybe decades ago there was people actively looking into. There's so many areas of government where we didn't show up, we stopped showing up and our presence became foreign. And now we don't get that sort of access anymore. You know, we used to ask for things regularly. We stopped asking. And then when you ask now, they say, what, what, why should we give you that? And it's like, you have to give me that. It's just been a while. And, I, and so much of the job is sort of trying to remind people of their obligations and making sure that things continue to be provided. We're not even talking about improving the level of things that are provided, maintaining a status quo, holding the line on things. I, I, I had to wait, I mean, not to go off on the, a rant, but I did a story for the Banner newsletter about uh, the fire, the awful fire at the uh, on Stricker Street that cost. Yeah, I, I want to talk about fire. that story. Go ahead. I mean, you know, it was mentioned that there was a previous fire there in 2015 where also four firefighters were injured. So I wanted to get the incident report for that incident. 
very simple request, something that should take probably five minutes, if not you know, at the end of the business, 16 days to get that report. Had to go up to the city solicitor himself. Why is uh, that? Is there, is there something, once that happens, or you think, oh, now they're hiding something. Like the minute you don't get it right away, no, but once who's back there doing... scrubbing? And then all of a no. sudden the reporter mind and use like, this is how we find out about Wayne Jenkins, literally, right? I mean, it's, it's one thing that leads to another thing. I, I would say though that, in my experience, though, once I get got, got that report, it really didn't say anything. It's really just this, ad, this bad attitude among government of just sort of, you know, let's make this difficult. Let's make this difficult and so that it won't even bother asking for it. Um, and, and, and um, you know, I got, yeah, it took 16 days to get the report. I texted the mayor. I called the city solicitors. Like, and this is not something that I should be bothering these people at that level about. But it, these are the day in and day out challenges and why we need to Hold the line. You know, we the judiciary just changed something to the online court database. And my colleague Tim is he sent an email out to 20 important people saying you can't do this. <laughs> You're supposed to have a meeting where you where you clear these things. You know, these are the types of things we do that don't make the paper. We don't write an article about it, but it's it's the fighting that like needs to occur in order to keep things oh, it's, uh, open. It's so important and it's so frustrating to some of us who spent a long time in government that that transparency. D does not exist. Hey, Justin, what, what's the difference so far, do you think? And I, when you all discuss it, um, between writing a fully digital project product versus uh, a digital and print product, how, how does, what's your thoughts on that? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there's often times where things couldn't run at certain lengths because they were being cut for print. And I would say, but we have unlimited space online. Shouldn't we allow it to be longer? Now, the flip side to that is, you know, maybe those things, maybe those restraints are good. Maybe readers don't want a long story and we should be cognizant of that anyway. But I'm excited about the opportunity to sort of like not be constrained by that, not be constrained by the print paper, the demands of the print paper, the deadlines, the, you know, is this a Sunday story? Is this a Monday story? Just sort of, you know, we're going to think about when's the best time to put it out, period. And what's the best length to put it out, period, and not be constrained by those things. I, I'm also, I'm, I'm, you know, it's sad to not be part of a print paper because I know there are many readers that do get the print paper, um, you know, um, especially older residents and things like that who are probably picking up the paper going, I haven't seen Justin's name in a while. Where did he go? <laughs> they don't know. They don't know that I have a tweet pinned that says I'm going to the Baltimore banner. But again, we're going to try to educate people on that. We're going to have a bit marketing campaign when we come out and, and just remind people we're trying to try to get the word out as best we can. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to remind people, please, please be prepared to subscribe to the Baltimore band. I, I want to talk about that. Cause Justin, you make a decision to do this fundamentally about where the future of the industry is going. And, uh, one of my dear friends, Chuck Kilgore was one of the printers that was, you know, Delaware out a, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine whose father was a printer at the sun when I worked there in 1986, 87, 88. Um, and, and where the industry is going and where Stewart's vision is and where MTS Patel and, uh, and, and Kimmy and all the people that are in your, place trying to build something from scratch i mean i don't uh, other than uh, you know i guess the examiner played this game 15 years ago saying we're going to start something from nothing with a bad idea everything i've heard about this and bringing all of you capable seasoned people on that makes it attractive to people like me and don to say oh well you know they have real reporters there what what about this global decision over the last, not just six months, but literally over the last 10 years at the sun and save our sun and all of those things that we were a part of that ultimately lets you believe this is going to work. What, what about this makes you believe this works? I'm really encouraged by the fact that before they started hiring reporters over the past month or so, they had business people with experience at wall street journal, Dow Jones, other places. They were, they've been here for almost a year. They've been laying the groundwork to make sure this is successful. I think one of the things that they've said is that there's some startups in other cities, other places where a bunch of journalists say, you know what, the business people are terrible. The penny pinchers and the hedge funds and all these things, we need to get out from under that. Let's start our own publication. And they have good intentions, but they don't know what they're doing as far as a business side. These folks have had smart business people in place for some time, and they're laying things out that are going to, I think, um, really en enable us to be successful. We're going to have a, a clean functional website <laughs> we're gonna have reliable billing and delivery i mean things like that that like i you know i think that people have come to be frustrated with you know um legacy outlets from and we're gonna be a non-profit you know we have a different view on this all the, the whole um 
approach, the nonprofit approach, I think is also going to cause us to look at things differently. So, so I, you know, I, yeah. Go ahead. I'm so, sorry. Well, no, I'm just, you know, Stuart Bainham, who is who's, um, funding this in large part, you know, he's made a commitment and, um, you know, is a little bit scary. Sure. You know, it's a new thing. Yeah, I don't know. I started to question whether Baltimore could sustain one main outlet, let alone two. I mean, so there's there's risk for sure. Um, but I think that that's on us now. You know, the business people are, are setting things up and it's on us journalists to now do great journalism. Well, we you know, we certainly p- plan to do our part to to promote the banner and get people to pay attention. You know, Justin, it may have been your last article or close to your last article uh, for the Baltimore Sun had to do with the food project. And I was struck because I thought it was such a Justin Fenton opening sentence. And I, I can still recall the sentence. It's the first time Troy, and I forget Troy's last name. Rush, Troy Rush. Yep. Troy Rush was shot. And I thought, ju- that's such, I remember watching the, uh, the Hemingway documentary and Hemingway is quoted as saying, start each day by trying to write one perfect sentence. If you can write one perfect sentence, then you can build. And I thought the first time Troy Rush was shot. And then you describe him running toward this place called the Food Project. I, I thought, was that your last article for The Sun? It was, and I'm very proud it was my last article for this. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> tell folks about the food project and Troy, because I was moved by it. Carol, the food project is a program for youth, um, older youth, teenagers, young, young men and women in the Carrollton Ridge neighborhood of Southwest Baltimore. And that's a neighborhood that is quite frankly, like haunted me for some time. It is one, it is perhaps the most challenged neighborhood in Baltimore. Um, incredible amount of vacancy, um, lots of uh, open air drug drug dealing and using, lots of fires, lots of gun violence, and you know I I um I came to the story last summer because a source told me that uh, one of the teenagers who had um, beaten up Ricky Specter, the city councilwoman who was carjacked and beaten up, that he'd been charged with a murder, and basically. I thought, you know, I went back to the coverage of that case. Ms. Spector had really tried to help that young man and the other um, person who had also attacked her. She wanted to help them. She didn't want them to go to jail. She wanted them to get support. And I thought, well, what happened? You know, if he was set up with this program, how did that happen? And the story was going to be basically about a, a, a young man who committed a, a horrible crime after getting a second chance after committing a previous horrible crime. And as, and as I started talking to her and the people at the Food Project, they said, you know, you've got it all wrong, which usually for me is, I said, no, no, you know, I, I'll tell the story. You don't tell me how to write the story. I, I, you know, I'm going to evaluate this and tell the story I, I, that I think is there. But they really did a great job of con- convincing me that this program lacks resources. And this is a program, and Carrollton Ridge has had 30 homicides over the past two years. That is far and away more than any other city neighborhood. And, and this is the, one of the only programs is trying to help people in that area. And they don't have any funding. So what they said was, you know, every time a young person gets shot, you know, they, they have the budget to help maybe 12 people at a time there, um, a drop in a bucket. When something tragic happens, all of a sudden, 40 people show up at the door saying, we, we want to get out of this kind of lifestyle. We want support. We want to help our families. And she don't have the money for it. The city made available $50 million in funding uh, for, from COVID relief for anti-violence. But, the, but they applied for money and couldn't get any. They were told, you're not an anti-violence program, you know. That's what, you know, there's more other organizations that more acutely work on anti-violence, but they're saying getting people jobs, giving them somewhere to go, that's anti-violence, that's keeping them out of trouble. So my last crime story for The Sun didn't quote police at all. It wasn't a police story. It's about a community that that believes they have an answer to the problem and they they, 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 they need help. And so I was hoping that by getting the word out that that would get them some help. I'm doing a a book event that's sold out, so I'm not advertising it, but at at Monument City Brewing on Saturday, and they're gonna donate, they asked me, we wanna donate some of the proceeds of the event from from beer sales and otherwise. I can't come, what if I'm thirsty, man? Come on. (laughs) They're 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 gonna donate the the proceeds to the food project. So, you know, and I I wanna continue, I I think it's set me up well for the transition because I wanna do more stories like that, that, that talk about, what are some of the people who have solutions? How can we help them? And how can we be more positive 
Well, well the, the solution part of it, right, is part of like the journalism part. We're like, I don't provide solutions. I tell stories, right? And then, there, but, but you've moved, this has moved you in a different way, right? Is, is this part of the reporting you've done is, and seeing all of this carnage uh, as a part of it that you feel like that maybe the journalism pen can become a solution tool? I, I, I think you're right in that I am afraid to advocate solutions because I don't think I have if I had the solutions, I might, you know, I could, you know, I think these are very challenging problems. And I think offering solutions can be risky for a journalist. But at the same time, I think we, I think we want to do more solutions based journalism here, highlighting things that work, highlighting things that people believe will work and trying to put that to the test and, 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 and do more of, it's very, the city has a lot of challenges and it's very easy to say, look at all the things that are screwed up. And I want to say, look at something that's screwed up, but but maybe also, and, and here's one way that we, we might be able to fix it. So I think we're going to, you're going to see more of that type of journalism at the banner. I'm getting so, crab cake with him. That's it. And, he sold and, and, and you know, it's so, so fitting. It cuts right to the core of Baltimore positive and what you're going to see on the banner. Again, that article on the food project, I would encourage everyone go out, Google it, Justin Fenton food project. It ends with a banner hangs in the interior of the building where Dorsey and others are working to open the food projects, restaurant and business incubator grinding two times as hard in honor of Troy Rush Jr. It's about as positive as it gets. Check it out, folks. Justin, good luck on the HBO series. Good luck at the Baltimore banner. And we look forward to having you back on soon. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, dude, I'm going to be following you on Twitter. And whenever you get into that suite and they give you the champagne, and I mean, you have to sit for six hours and watch your own thing, right? So I don't know if you're going to do that all in one sitting or how it's going to go. But uh, I definitely want you tweeting about uh, your excitement level because uh, I think we're excited about watching it. Yeah, I hope to do some, like, behind-the-scenes tweets, little little nuggets of, uh, you know, uh, fun facts about things from the making of the show. Tell, tell Simon, I've got that Maledict, the book. It's in paperback. He's going to love it. All right? He, he's going to love it. Believe me. I, I love reading it in his voice. Justin Fenton here of the Baltimore Banner. We're having more Banner folks on, former Sun folks on. Uh, we are getting the Maryland Crab Cake Tour back out on the road. We're coming to Canton at Mama's on the Half Shell and Nacho Mama's having the Scunny Crab Cake. That'll happen on Friday the 4th to honor my father's birthday's March 5th. We're, uh, it's all presented by the Maryland Lottery. We'll be letting ourselves play and getting it back out. All of our wise conversations also brought to you by friends at wise markets and uh, we're very appreciative of their sponsorship as well don what a banner week we're having around here huh doesn't get any better than this i will have the popcorn on april the 25th there you go all right well uh, ice down the drinks i'll be over in catonsville in the 21228 i am nestor on behalf of former baltimore county executive don moeller we are wnst am 1570 towson baltimore and we never stop talking baltimore positive